Hello and welcome to this conversation with amazing Beth Shelley. She is a wonderful woman and she has, I think, maybe the most experience with women's health uh, than any person I have met. <laughs> you started working with women's health 1985. That's right. Great. Yeah. So amazing, and you've done so much within the area of women's health. And I'm so happy to have, have this conversation with you today uh, about mostly about prolapse. Mm -hmm. So we'll go more into that. But I would love if you could start to tell us a bit more about who you are and your background. Sure, I'm very pleased to be here. And I, my journey began when I was in college. And at that point, I was already married and uh, became pregnant with my first child, recognizing a lot of changes that go on in the body. As a physical therapist, I was interested, you know, what can we do to help? And there was so little. This was in the 1980s. So very little um, written, very little research at that point. But I really did seek out whatever there was and learned uh, more techniques so that when I graduated from college, I started teaching prenatal exercise. I love working with pregnant women and exercise and mommies uh, and their babies to recover. I also began in my practice to see women who had things like sciatica or neck pain related to the pregnancy. Very quickly, they started talking about leakage. So I began to learn in the uh, late 90s or late 80s and early 90s about how pelvic physical therapy could help. Again, there was very little written, very little research. So we kind of taught ourselves, but I so enjoyed that group. I continued to expand into postpartum moms and then um, postmenopausal women, elderly women, even children and men. Now I see all kinds of people in my practice. But I also had in the early days, women who would come to me and say, it hurts down there. Mm -hmm. And so the discovery about how the muscle can not only be weak, but it can also be in spasm. And the techniques that can be useful, just like you treat a spasm in the back, you can treat a spasm in the vagina. Mm. So that brought me down a different path. And mixed in with all of that is this diagnosis of prolapse and urgency, urgency frequency, uh, urgent continence. These are all things that tend to be buddied together. I uh, began teaching locally here in the United States and then internationally. I have several uh, chapters published in multiple textbooks. I have uh, my most recent uh, several chapters in a book called Facing Pelvic Pain, which is for patients and uh, very comprehensive um, that uh, many different professionals contributed to, written for the patient. Um, but uh, also have done some research and continue to treat patients and teach at this point. Amazing. Wow. Yeah, so um, the, 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 all the knowledge you have gained and, you know, all the patients you have seen and all the practitioners you have educated, you have found a connection between the nervous system and the pelvic floor, right? Absolutely. Can and you talk is, more about that? I think that's yes. so exciting. It is exciting because it is coming from a place of clear research. And this research is about 10 to 15 years old around the um, sensation of pain. So we have new pain research that is helping us to understand better how pain behaves and how it is different in different people. But the really interesting thing is that it is not only the sensation of pain that we're realizing behaves like this, but many other sensations, the sensation of urgency and the sensation of pressure of, or heaviness 
in the perineum or pelvic floor, which of course is the thing that most people with prolapse say occurs. So that sensation is uh, behaving and is responding as we are recognizing the sensation of pain is responding. And as you know, the body is way more complex than one plus one equals two, yes. right? There's yes. many, many factors are gonna influence what comes in the end. How you feel is related to many, many uh, sensations and many factors and many issues. And some of them we can change and some of them we can't change. And some of them have resulted inadvertently in a change in our nervous system. Mm. So this is what I would like to talk about, the uh, thing that I call the sensitive nervous system. The medical diagnosis being central sensitization. Mm. Yeah, please tell us more, more about that. The uh, sensitive nervous system has uh, increased ability to recognize things. And sometimes that's because it's on alert. Some of the sensitive nervous system is related to traumas, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, these situations where people are vigilant and aware but sometimes it's not, it's more subtle and related to a sensation that has occurred over and over and over and over, like a chronic pain or a chronic urge or a chronic pressure. So how it starts, we don't completely understand. But one thing that would be helpful is how do I recognize it? How do I know if my system is sensitive? Well, one of the ways that I describe this is to think about the alarm on your house. Most of the time when people set the alarm on their house, they set it so that if something breaks the window, the alarm goes off, right? The alarm is, is firing. In the sensitive nervous system, the set point of the alarm of the body is set so that if a leaf hits the window, uh, it goes off. Mm. So this is an increased ability to sense things, sometimes not helpful, sometimes too sensitive, mm. so that a feeling that somebody else would not have any awareness of, I have a lot of awareness of that sensation. And one thing that some of your listeners might identify with is the fact that the doctor says the bulge or the prolapse is so tiny teeny. And in my head, I feel this really big pressure, this really upsetting, really forceful pressure. Yes. But the doctor doesn't see it. The doctor just sees this little bitty thing. Well, one of the things I will say on a slight divergence is most of the testing that's done for prolapse is done lying down. Yes. That's not where prolapse occurs. No. So Isn't that crazy? Can, yes, it is crazy. If you can ask the practitioner to test you in standing. Yes. And especially test you at the end of the day in standing. And with pressure in standing at the end of the day, you're more likely to have them see the bulge. But even with all of that, there are still going to be situations in certain people where there just isn't a structural bulge that's very big. It's a small little bulge. The structure of your body is a small thing but the feeling is big. So I would encourage people to separate that out. Sometimes it connects. Sometimes there is a medium bulge and a medium sensation of heaviness. Sometimes there is a big bulge and a big sensation of heaviness, but those things don't always go together because sometimes there is a really big bulge, but you don't feel it very much. 
And sometimes there is a tiny little sensation or tiny little bulge, but you feel it a really lot. So they're separate. The feeling and the structure are separate. So then it's helpful to understand what things contribute to what you feel. And right. that's where, yeah, that's where we have this sensitive nervous system. Mm. One of the things that does appear to connect to the feeling of the, of the bulge is urgency. Mm. So this thing called urgency, the definition of that is a very strong sensation that you need to empty your bladder that is difficult to ignore. So you're running to the bathroom, running, 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 running to the bathroom. And then when you get there, it's a tiny little pee. Yeah. Yes. Why is this happening? Well, I, this would be a whole nother discussion, but I would urge people to learn about how to treat urgency, how to, there's lots of things you can do yourself to make urgency better. Mm -hmm. I will tell you really quickly, it is okay to ignore the urge to pee. It mm -hmm. is not okay to ignore the urge for bowel, but it is okay to ignore the urge for pee. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes that's part of the treatment. If it has only been 30 minutes since you went, you don't have to go again. There's not enough in there. You got to teach your bladder, be quiet, I'm fine. But there's more strategies than that. So this urgency is part of this, the nervous system that says, oh my goodness, I, I'm really sensitive. But there's other things too, where um, you have a small bump, a small twist of your ankle, and it really, really hurts. And it hurts for a long, long time. People who have um, a dental procedure and they need more and more and more Novocaine. Sometimes there are other conditions that go with it, like irritable bowel syndrome or interstitial cystitis mm. or fibromyalgia. Mm. These are all buddies of the sensitive nervous system. So I wonder if that is the case, what then can you do about it? Yeah. Right? Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes. So some people say, that's how I'm born. That's just me. That's the way I am. Well, that might be true, but it's usually a small percentage of people that are, it is unchangeable. So the reality is that our brains are so amazing that they have the ability to increase our awareness of things and decrease our awareness of things. Yes. And my very best example of that is the bra. Okay. When you first put your bra on, it's pretty uncomfortable. Oh my goodness, you think I'm gonna be able to live with this every day? You know, when you were a kid and your mom said, you gotta wear this thing and you're thinking, oh, it's so uncomfortable and I don't wanna have it on. And as soon as you can, you take it off. Right. So that's the way it is in the beginning. But over time, the nerves that are in this area, right, where, where your bra is, those nerves, they begin to desensitize. They begin to calm down. Now, you can still tell you have a bra on. So if you think about it, yes, I feel it. But it doesn't take up your every moment. Mm -hmm. Right. It's it's uh, in the background. Your brain, your subconscious brain has quieted those sensations. Mm, so we, that's have so the, yeah. yes, we have the ability to make them more or make them less. Mm. Now, what makes them more? There's really a very simple word that people may recognize. And that is the word fear. Yeah. Wow. Does that, that make sense? Yes. Yes. And the, the gentler word is worry. Mm. 
So fear and worry are kind of on the same scale, right? Yeah. And, and when a woman feels with her hand, she feels a bump mm. or she sees in the mirror, oh my goodness, there's a bump. Mm. There is a worry at the very least, if not a fear. And oftentimes, I'm sure you've heard other people say this, they feel like, oh my goodness, I have cancer, right? <laughs> Tumor. I'm going to die. Yeah. Well, what the nervous system does is then it starts to become more aware. Mm. It starts to become more vigilant because I'm afraid in order to survive, I need to know what's going on down there. Yeah. So another analogy that I use that I think um, is helpful is to think of the brain as the board of directors of a company. Hmm. So we have the left elbow company and we have our department, the left elbow department, and we have the right knee department and we have the left ear department. You know, we have all these places and every department is sending information to the brain at every moment. So hmm. we receive information from all over the body every moment of the day. Hmm. And the subconscious mind, the board of directors looks at all those reports and says, left elbow, check, right knee, check, uh, left big toe, check, they're all fine, we don't have to be pay attention. But when there's a problem, then it sends a report to the president, your conscious brain, and it says, your right toe is hurting because you just stubbed it, right? So then the brain says, okay, we got to act. Well, when there are reports coming from a certain area, like the vagina pelvis, so the vagina pelvis is sending a pressure. I feel a pressure. I feel a pressure. I feel a pressure. The board of directors keep sending that to the brain. And ultimately, the brain says, look, this pelvis vagina department, this is a problem department. I want to receive the reports very often and I want them to come straight to me. No stopping at the board of directors. So you see how that just escalates over time, over our concern and worry, we get more and more awareness of what's going on down there. It is not normal to think about your vagina all day. No, I know. And it's so horrible to do it. I was there and to kind of break that cycle, it took me months. And then, you know, I had like one minute where I was not thinking about it. And I celebrated because that one minute was so amazing. But then I was back in my <laughs> thinking about it. And then next time, two minutes. But it's, I've never experienced that before, how you can think about a body part so much, like be so aware all the time. Mm -hmm. It is true. And what you said is perfect because reversing this is very slow. 